Good morning. Good morning, Sophia. I'm Alan Hutchison. I'm Christopher Hutchison. We are a father and son team. We are British and Swiss. We moved to Bulgaria in 2012, and in 2013, we started our company, Prosfit, which is the first company to drive digital transformation in the prosthetics industry. We really appreciate the opportunity to be with you here today. So we decided on the topic, which was to share with you about overcoming adversity and creating positive change. Now, we believe that the two are fundamentally linked. And if you take the same approach and the same principles, you can achieve both. Yeah, so we're guessing that if we said to you people out here, who has never suffered any adversity in your life, we would probably get a stony silence, no hands going up in the air, um, so we won't even bother. But what is the link between adversity and positive change? Well, we actually believe that they're on a linear scale. So if you have an adversity or a hardship in your life that, let's say, is minus 10, you normally want to move that back to zero. So you move it back to zero, and for many people, that's where they want to stop, because they've achieved their goal. However, what we would like you to do is think about moving it to plus 10. Move it into the range of positive change. Because if everybody does that, the world will become a better place. So, having talked about adversity and positive change, let's start with what was the adversity in our life that we would like to talk to you about today. In uh, July 2009, I was involved in an accident. Uh, I was at a train station in Switzerland on the platform, and friends of mine were inside the train. Uh, I was leaning against the open window. We were in the middle of conversation, and uh, suddenly the train pulled off without any warning. Uh, so, as you can imagine, I fell between the train and the platform. I couldn't release myself, and the result was I suffered an amputation to my left leg below the knee and also to my right leg above the knee. <sighs> As you can imagine, that's a, a clear moment where there's a before and after, and it has a very big impact on your life and the lives of your family and all those who are around you. Yeah, as Christopher mentioned, this wasn't just a uh, life-threatening and life-changing event for him. Everybody around him, uh, their lives were disrupted. Uh, the whole family was impacted. Uh, my wife and I, uh, we both actually had to stop work. My wife didn't work for almost a year. Uh, I didn't work for about six months while we were getting Christopher rehabilitated. This obviously impacted our, our economic livelihood. Our daughter, who was five, she didn't see Christopher for three months uh, because he was in and out of intensive care. She was absolutely traumatized. And in fact, she, uh, for a few years after that, uh, was, was fairly insecure. I would say that she's just beginning to recover now. So in addition to the, uh, the, um, what we suffered as, uh, as a family, Christopher also suffered some injustice. Because actually, the adversity that you can face it can be, as in Christopher's case, injury. It can be health, as you heard, economic circumstances, mm. personal circumstances, and also injustice. And that was one that Christopher faced as well. Essentially, after his accident, he was painted publicly by the Swiss railways as, um, as are many victims uh, of uh, accidents, blame the victim. And in fact, while Christopher was still in a coma five days after the accident, the railways put out a a report saying that uh, the victim behaved inadequately when the train was leaving the station. Now, um, in many countries, to make a statement like that without proper inquiry or investigation would actually be considered unacceptable, if not actually not legal. Mm. So anyway, we're not here to talk about that. What we'd like to do is talk about how we went from that negative a lot side of the scale to what we're now trying to do to move everybody to the mm. positive side of the scale. So, to explain, after you're in an accident where you result in an amputation, it's a difficult situation. You're in a lot of pain, you'll spend months in a hospital bed, but eventually, naturally, you want to get out and you want to be mobile again. So, to do that, it takes months to reach that point, but eventually you've recovered enough and your wounds have healed enough that you can be fitted with prostheses. Right? So prosthetic legs, which you need to walk again. 
Now, that's something that unfortunately is a very difficult process still. And not only at the beginning for the first sockets, but over the duration of your life as an amputee. So my experience with socket, uh, with socket fitting was actually pretty rough. You <laughs> take a long time uh, at the center getting work done. It's really not very comfortable, and it actually in many cases it's quite painful. So the net result of that is that even with the best will in the world and the best working with the best professionals in the world, in the end, for a lot of amputees, you get sockets that are just not very comfortable. And you are just going to have to put up with that. So, and the trigger was when we were on the flight. Yes. I was in exactly that situation, and we were on a long-haul flight, where then, on the plane, your legs swell. Anybody's legs swell. But unfortunately, in my situation, the more my legs swelled, the tighter the sockets got, until a point that essentially blood was flowing into my legs, but wasn't circulating back out again, and it got extremely painful. And I was uh, pretty much feeling the same pain that Krista was feeling and sweating just as much. Yeah. And so we started to talk about how sockets are made. We had to uh, do something to relax, so we started to talk about how sockets are made. And um, I went back to when actually I was not much uh, different age to Christopher today. I had just left Oxford University, and when I was there, I actually had, in, in addition to being an engineering student, I actually played a lot of jazz as well. And um, I wanted to stay there because the jazz was more interesting than going into my career. So I took a, I took a job with uh, a, a professor who was developing a knee implant. And remember, this is 1981. Knee implant, and my job was to use computer-aided design technologies and finite element analysis technologies to investigate the interaction between the knee implant and the rest of the bone, soft tissue, and, and muscle. So having done that more than 30 years ago, we said, but why is nobody using this sort of technology to fit uh, prosthetics today? So that essentially was the birth of our company, CrossFit, which we'll talk about in, in a moment. Um, so we got off the plane. We took a big piece of paper, actually three of them, three pieces of A3 paper. Mm -hmm. We mind mapped out the whole what was going on. And we basically said, we'll stop doing everything else in our life, and we founded CrossFit, and that was in August 2013. Yes. So, what has this actually all got to do with the title of this talk, which was, Give Me a Lever Long Enough? So, you may be familiar with how this sentence ends. It's a quotation from Archimedes, who was an ancient Greek philosopher and mathematician. Give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum upon which to place it, and I will move the world. So, a lever, as you know, is a tool or even a, an approach or a principle that means that when you put effort in, that's magnified and multiplied, and you can create much greater force coming out of it. Yeah, so that essentially is the theme. So one of the things that we had to think about is, what were we going to lever? But before going into that, we need to give you um, a little bit more about what is the challenge with the socket, and also the size of the issue. So, as I mentioned before, my experience with fitting sockets was not the easiest in the world. And it's not easy for anybody. In fact, if you're making a prosthesis, that's the most complicated piece, because it's got to fit each individual person in a way that's custom-made, and you have to be able to put your full body weight on it. So, arguably, it's the most important part, because no matter how great the rest of the leg is, if you're not comfortable to put it on, it's very difficult to walk with it. So, maybe a parallel situation. Yeah, if, if, I'm sure some of you out there are skiers. Just try skiing with boots that don't fit. You know exactly what happens. And by the way, it doesn't matter how good your skis are, having lousy boots doesn't make you a better skier. There's even the corollary, which is, if you have good boots, you can maybe even ski on anything. So the socket, which is the bit that goes on the limb, is the, is the equivalent of the, of the ski boot. Hmm. So this is a big challenge that has to be faced the world over. Yeah, so let me uh, talk about the, the size of the challenge. You may or may not be aware, some of you maybe know amputees, now you know Christopher, I don't know if you know any others, but actually in the world today, there's around 10 million amputees. 
By 2050, there will be between 45 and 50 million amputees. So we're going to see a five times growth in the number of amputees in the world. In Europe today, about one in a thousand people have an amputation. In the United States, the official statistic for last year was one in 190 people have an amputation. So the main cause of diabetes isn't what you may imagine it to be, which is war or road traffic accidents. It's actually diabetes. Diabetes is driving uh, amputation. It starts with the feet and it slowly starts to, to move up the limbs. So start living healthily now so that when you get to my age, the doctor's not going to tell you suddenly that you need an amputation. So that's the, so what we were faced with, number of amputees going up and actually the number of trained professionals going down. So the people who actually can do what they did for Christopher fit a, a socket, the number of them is going down. So at a certain point the industry is going to implode. And this is where we got back to the concept of leverage. What is it that we have to leverage to provide a solution? So in our case we le leveraged our combined experiences and our knowledge and of those around us and we arrived at a technical solution, a technology solution which is digital transformation in the prosthetics industry. Our first solution for fitting sockets is essentially instead of covering the person in plaster to get the shape of the leg, 3D scan it. Much faster and much more comfortable experience. Then instead of the professional having to spend hours and hours, up to 10, 15 hours in some case in the workshop, to get the socket designed, you can do that on screen with software that we've developed that give the same tools. The result is a socket that we centrally manufacture with 3D printing and deliver back for the person to have fit and to wear. So to show you mine, these are the first 3D printed prosthetic sockets to be fully regulated in Europe as medical devices and now even ISO certified as well. Yeah. So this is, this is where we are, but actually we also know, I mean, I'm an industrial business developer and part of what I contributed to here in, into what we're doing was having a technology solution isn't enough. The entrepreneurial graveyard is full of companies that thought that only having a technology solution would get them into a good business. It's not true. Um, you need to have Invention, which is what we've done, and exploitation. Um, and in fact, uh, if you take those two words, you throw them up in the air, invention and exploitation, you might see the word innovation landing right in front of you. And in fact, innovation is all about what you do and how you do it. So let's talk a little bit about... Uh, how we leverage. Yeah, how we do. How we do the leverage. So when you uh, have a great idea, um, and you have a solution, you really need to have a vision about where you want to go. You need to have faith in that vision, self-belief, confidence. You also need to have a lot of humility. Uh, you need people around you that share your vision and your self-belief and humility. Focus is a very important issue, as is timing. One of the important things is having the courage to make the right decisions. And lastly, giving yourself the time to reflect and think about what can go wrong in the business. So maybe just to give an example of each of those. So in our business, the vision of CrossFit is a world where innovation provides limb wearers a choice of affordable, reliable, and desirable prosthetic products and services. That's a big vision, but actually it's all achievable. We can give people things that are affordable, that work, that, uh, that they actually like. I mean, today you see more and more amputees, for instance, through the, uh, the Paralympics, showing their prostheses, and it's almost becoming a fashion item for a number of amputees. So have a big vision, believe in it. Have faith, self-confidence, don't let people put you off track. Uh, have faith and don't let it turn to fear. You have faith, don't let others put doubt in your mind, because otherwise your positive energy will move to negative energy. On the other hand, don't become arrogant. Have humility. And that humility basically means accept the reality of the situation you're in. You're going to make, mistake, make mistakes. Own up to it. Don't play the blame game. Make sure that whenever there's a problem that happens, identify it, fix it. And in fact, 
we, uh, we, we very much like a book uh, by uh, Matthew Syed, which is called Black Box Thinking. And in fact, we encourage all of our team to read it, and I would encourage you to do the same. It's exactly on that theme. So after that, we're talking about people and shared values. Get the people around you that believe in what you're doing. Be they that your team, your shareholders, people in the community, people that just believe what you're doing. And by the way, there will be plenty out there that you, you know, don't believe in what you're doing. Don't waste your time with them. Listen to them. They may have a valid point, but don't spend too much time with them. Focus is the next one. So believe me, when things aren't quite going right, the first thing you tend to do is shift focus. Don't do it. Stay on focus. If you really believe in what you're doing, stay on focus. Timing. Almost got that timing wrong there. Um, timing. Uh, <laughs> we have still just about enough time for it. Uh, yeah, so timing is, is important because every situation you're in, whether overcoming your adversity or building something from that, it will have its own pace. If you try to push it too fast, you will break it. If you go too slow, you will lose the opportunity. Understand the pace in the uh, industry that you're working in. Last two, first is um, courage. Um, courage to make decisions. Whether it's a big decision, a small decision, a tough decision. Actually, it's not that difficult. If you figure out in advance your decision-making rules. Sometimes, when these conditions happen, that's the decision I take. Lastly, and this is a little bit in contrast to the way uh, we work today, take the time out to reflect and think. And think about what can go wrong. It's the, even if you have everything right, it's the one thing that can go wrong that can take you down. So really, take time out. I do it when I'm playing the piano. I walk the dogs. I know Christopher does the same. Build reflection and allowance for reception, uh, reflection into your culture. So I would say... That's a little bit the prescription of, of what we've learned and we'd like to pass on to you. And we're doing not too bad yeah. today. So, if we can have one takeaway and if there's really only one thing even that you remember from this session today, please make it. If you have the chance to overcome adversity, do not stop there. Keep going and you can create a massive amount of positive change for yourself and for others. If we all do this, Together, we can move the world. Thank you. Thank you very much.